and they are um, undertaking a nationwide book tour right now. They've already been to New Jersey, Boston, Los Angeles, Denver, Chicago, Madison, Wisconsin, and Washington, D.C. And after us, they're going on to Vermont, Montreal, Toronto, Seattle, and the Bay Area before they return to Scotland. Um, and this is uh, Robin Yassine Kassab and Leila Ashami. Uh, I'll first introduce Robin, who is also the author of the critically acclaimed novel The Road from Damascus and is a contributor to the anthology <coughs> Syria Speaks Art and Culture from the Frontline. He is a co-editor of the blog Pulse and a former co-editor of the journal Critical Muslim. His writing has appeared in The Guardian, Al Jazeera English, Foreign Policy, The National, The New Arab, and other outlets, and he has also appeared on the BBC and other channels. Uh, Leila Ashami is a blogger and activist who has worked uh, over the past 15 years with human rights and civil society groups in Syria and across the Middle East, um, as well as with international human humanitarian organizations. She is a founding member of Tahrir ICN, a network that connects anti-authoritarian struggles across the Middle East, North Africa, and Europe. And her blog can be found at leilashami.wordpress.com. That's L-E-I-L-A-S-H-A-M-I. Dot wordpress .com. Welcome to the two of you, and as I understand it, Layla is going to begin, then Robin, and then we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for coming today, especially on such a beautiful day, and thank you to New York University um, for hosting us. Um, the Syrian revolution, um, I think, is, is a revolution which people have described as the orphaned revolution. It failed to attract the kind of solidarity that certainly revolutionary Syrians um, would have liked uh, over the past five years. And I think this is largely due to some key misconceptions um, about what's happening in Syria. Um, and very often these misconceptions have actually uh, been spread by commentators that identify as being part of the left, although I think these terms left and right uh, are having less and less meaning. One of the, the misconceptions that we're hearing very much in the media is that this, what's happening in Syria is part of some intractable uh, Sunni-Shia conflict that's been going on for millennia uh, because that's the way these people are. They have this uh, sectarian hatred runs through uh, the veins of Arab people. And this really um, isn't the root cause uh, of what's going on in Syria today. Um, the Shia are only 1% uh, of the population in Syria. Uh, prior to the revolution, they were never particularly associated with the regime. Um, despite uh, often being told in the media that the Alawi are Shia, this is uh, not true. Um, both Orthodox Sunni and Orthodox Shia traditionally see Alawis as heretics. Um, and the alliance with Iran is not a theological alliance, um, it's really a political alliance. So I think the question that we need to ask um, is why uh, these communities have lived together uh, for centuries and at times of conflict or at times of political crisis, tensions between communities break out. And I would argue that this is the manipulation of sectarian divisions by power politics for divide and rule purposes. And certainly Robin will talk a little bit more about that later. Um, this narrative also overlooks the fact uh, that many Alawis have stood in solidarity with the revolution. There's been key uh, Alawi figures in the revolution. One example, uh, the writer and feminist Sama Yazbek, who's written uh, two fantastic books about her, her uh, participation in the revolution, and also overlooks the fact that many Sunnis uh, stayed loyal to the regime. Another one of the misconceptions is that this is a secular or socialist resistance regime. Um, the Assad regime is not a secular regime, it's a sectarian regime in which uh, one group, the Alawi sect um, from which uh, the president belongs, is overrepresented over um, in the government, in the army and in the security forces. 
Um, it's also not a socialist regime, it's a neoliberal regime. Uh, neoliberal economic reforms were brought in under Hafez al-Assad, the former president, and really sped up uh, under Bashar during his first decade in power. And what was practiced in Syria was a particularly corrupt form of crony capitalism where economic benefits um, were given to the uh, Assad family and to regime loyalists. Just to give one example, um, the, the president's cousin, Rami Makhlouf, uh, was estimated to control some 60% of the Syrian economy. Meanwhile, during this period, the social safety net of the poor was really dismantled. Uh, subsidies, such as for food and fuel, were taken away. And in this uh, <coughs> decade leading up to the revolution, we see large sections of the population becoming increasingly impoverished. Uh, Syrian families struggling to put food on their table. And this is very important because when the revolution breaks out, it breaks out in disadvantaged, uh, in disadvantaged rural areas and working class suburbs. Also, I think we shouldn't see the regime as a resistance regime despite its populist rhetoric. It, um, it's often uh, used this uh, war with Israel to gain popularist support. In effect, um, this conflict with Israel was the justification for decades of emergency law, which suspended constitutional rights of citizens and was the law used to suppress political dissent. Also, the resistance narrative overlooks um, the Assad regime's role in the 80s um, and the tens of thousands of Palestinians um, that it slaughtered in Lebanon, uh, what it's doing today in Yarmouk, in Yarmouk camp, with a very brutal siege which really uh, shines beyond anything uh, the Israeli siege of Gaza. Um, people are living in absolutely desperate conditions. Over 400 Palestinians have been tortured to death by the Assad regime since the start of the revolution. Also, the regime cooperated uh, with the US war on terror. Um, many uh, people were illegally rendered uh, to Syria by the CIA for torture by proxy. A very famous case of this is the Canadian citizen Maher Arar, who was picked up at JFK airport um, sent to Damascus where he was incarcerated and tortured for a year despite um, being completely innocent. Um, the other misconception is that this, what's happening in Syria is an American regime change. I mean it's amazing that this um, conception persists despite no evidence uh, to support such a claim whatsoever. Um, the uh, American uh, government has basically handed over Syria to other savage imperialisms, primarily Russia and Iran. The crowning glory of the Obama administration has been the deal that it's made with Iran. Now, we don't believe that sanctions should have been put on Iran in the first place, but it's very interesting that this deal has been done at a time when Iran is having a very expansionist, aggressive role in the region and is a key contributor to uh, the increase in sectarian tensions and Sunni identity politics which take their most savage manifestation with Daesh, the Islamic State. Um, for a long time um, the Americans were only sending non-lethal aid to the Free Syrian Army which it claims to support uh, more rhetorically than in reality. What was going in for a long time were ready meals, night vision goggles, certainly not the heavy weaponry and especially the anti-aircraft weaponry that communities needed to defend themselves from these scorched earth policies and the massive onslaught of the state. In fact, America's key intervention has been to veto other countries from sending anti-aircraft weapons into Syria. But um, the problem with many of these misconceptions is that that's where the debate has stayed. And the result of that is that people have really failed to look at the popular struggle on the ground and the massive achievements um, that people in Syria ha have, have gained over the past five years in extremely difficult circumstances, in an extremely... Um, an extremely severe humanitarian crisis which is breaking out in an extremely brutal conflict where so many different states are trying to control and manipulate the outcourse of events. 
Um, but there have been uh, some really wonderful achievements uh, by the Syrian people over the past five years. Um, one thing I would like to mention is the local councils in Syria. Um, throughout the liberated areas in Syria, and by liberated areas, I mean areas which are not controlled by either the regime or Daesh, you now have over 400 uh, local councils. Uh, many of these have had their uh, members democratically elected. It is in these councils where people are self-organising and self-governing their communities. It's these councils, these over 400 councils, which keep life functioning in the liberated areas. Um, their administrative structures, they're responsible for electricity, su electricity supply, garbage disposal, keeping medical and educational facilities running, often in people's basements, makeshift facilities because of the targeting of schools and hospitals by the regime and more recently by Russia. Um, so this is a massive achievement, I think, that in these circumstances, people are practicing democracy today in Syria. Uh, people are holding democratic elections for the first time in over four decades. And we're simply not hearing about it. We're simply not hearing about these achievements. The other uh, massive achievement in Syria has been the explosion in civil society organizations uh, over the past five years. Prior to 2011, there was no independent or active civil society existing in Syria. Now there's hundreds of civil society organizations engaged in a range of activities. For example, there's organizations set up to monitor human rights violations. One example of this is a group of young activists um, who have organised themselves in an organisation called Raqqa is being slaughtered silently. Um, this is based in Raqqa that you might have heard of. It's now the de facto capital of the Islamic <coughs> State. And these young activists are really risking their lives to report on the kind of abuses that people of Raqqa are suffering at the hands of Daesh. Um, other types of organisations that have spread up is women's centres. Syria is traditionally a very patriarchal, conservative society, but women have really pay, played a key role in the revolution. And there's now women's centres existing throughout the country which support women's activism and really support their engagement in the social, economic and political spheres. We also have many relief organisations, the White Helmets, a volunteer civil defence force, which are often the first on the scene of a, an attack to pull uh, victims from rubble of residential buildings which might have been targeted and take them to hospital. We also have dozens of free uh, radio stations <coughs> and uh, free newspapers in a climate where there was no independent press existing in Syria prior to the revolution, where the Committee to Protect Journalists called Bashar Syria the third worst country in the world to be a blogger. But now you have all of these independent media stations and newspapers where people are debating the revolution, the positive and the negative aspects. They're trying to inform their communities of what's happening. One example is a newspaper called Anna Baladi, or Local Grapes, which was founded by women in Daraya, a town near Damascus. Um, Daraya is a town which has suffered from daily barrel bombs. It suffered from one of these starvation sieges that you might have heard about, uh, where women, men, children have died of starvation in Daraya. It's also suffered from gas attacks. But amazingly, this uh, newspaper focuses on non-violent, unarmed civil resistance and really trying to keep the original goals of the revolution alive. Um, I think I'll stop there and hand over to you, Robert. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, do I need that? Or my voice is loud enough. Can you hear me at the back? You can hear me at the back, right. Um, my voice is louder than it should be, probably. I, I want to I go back very briefly to what Leila said about the local councils and, and put it in this context. Remember, a decade ago, um, more than a decade ago, 13 years ago, supposedly, um, we, as a British person now, we in Britain and America felt that Arabs having democracy was so important 
It was yeah. such a high priority for us that we were prepared to move hundreds of thousands of men and machines and weapons across the seas and to spend billions of dollars and to kill lots and lots of people and blow lots of stuff up in order to bring democracy to the Arabs. And that didn't work out very well because, of course, demos means people and it's only the people themselves that can build their own democracy. Nobody else can do it for them. You can't import or export democracy with tanks and planes. Um, I don't think that the, the invasion and occupation of Iraq was really about democracy, but that was the rhetoric and lots of people seemed to, to believe it at the time. And then here we are today, of these local councils, there are well over 400 local and provincial councils in Syria. At a provincial level, they are all democratically elected. Um, a year ago, um, apparently a third of the local councils were democratically elected, but since then there have been elections in the Ghouta, in, in, in the south around Dera, so now I would say that at least a third, probably, are um, democratically elected. Um, and we don't even know about it. I would expect that even many people in this room, even many of the engaged people who've chosen to come to this talk, haven't heard about them. And certainly if you ask people in the street, Everybody's heard of the mad headcutters, the transnational jihadists that have piled into Syria and Iraq to take advantage of the chaos there. Um, everybody's heard of the supposed battle between states, which are very often actually in agreement with each other. Um, but nobody knows about this. So something that was so important uh, more than a decade ago that we were prepared to, to declare war over it, now it's so unimportant that we don't even care about reading about it, uh, um, the, a lot of the big commentators who pose as reporters from Syria um, will tell you all kinds of stories about these kind of things that Leila was talking about, but they won't ever tell you about these remarkable people on the ground practicing democracy and keeping life going in the most difficult of circumstances. I think that um, speaks about a failure here. I think that shows that we here have a cultural and civilizational problem of a scale of the one in the Middle East. Um, I think we should all really think about that. I, I really do. Um, why do we not hear about these, you know, over 60 free newspapers and magazines and all these civil society organizations and people practicing democracy and organizing their own communities to keep life going? Um, it's in part because of these inaccurate grand narratives, big stories, these very orientalist stories that we arrive, um, you know, we, we already think we know what's happening in Syria, so we don't have the need to ask people on the ground what's happening. We don't, there's no need to actually look at the detail because we think we already know. We already have a story which explains it to us. Those stories don't work. The other reason why we don't see it, I think, is because it's become a war. And once it's become a war, then we can see the guns and the violence and the, the hell on earth that Syria has become. We, we see the, the chess game of states and we can't see the people. Um, we see the terrorism as well and the refugee crisis and the ways in which it may affect us. We don't see the people on the ground. So I want to talk a little bit about the militarization of the revolution, how that happened, why that happened. Because there are a lot of people that say, you know, at the beginning I could support the, the protest movement in Syria when it was peaceful, but then they decided to become violent. They decided to pick up guns, and at that point I can no longer support them. And um, so the first question is, was militarization a mistake? And I think the answer, or one of the answers anyway, is yes. In many obvious ways, it was definitely a mistake. And why was it a mistake? For a variety of reasons. Firstly, because it alienated key constituencies inside Syria and outside Syria that the revolution needed to win over. So certain members, not all of them, but members of religious minorities, for example, when they saw bearded men from the countryside shouting Allahu Akbar with Kalashnikovs in their hands, a lot of people got scared. They thought, wait, wait a minute, this might not be about democracy and, and social justice, it might be about armed Islamism coming to, to kill us. Um, 
Of course, the West got scared. Of course, the bourgeoisie got scared when they saw working class men with guns. It looked scary to them. It was also, and more fundamentally, a mistake because once it got militarized, you move from this mass movement, horizontally organized, which brought together people from a huge range of um, ideological, sectarian, um, ethnic, regional, and class backgrounds, um, it transformed that movement into a cacophony of a thousand competing authoritarians. Because, of course, when you get a, a, a lots of militias, you get lots of militia leaders. And each militia leader has to reach out to rich men in <coughs> Syrian society, rich men in the Gulf, um, ri other states begging for weapons and for funds, and, and then they're all in competition with each other. They have to say, I'm more Muslim than him, I'm more violent than he is, and I'm stronger than he is, so give your weapons to me, not to, to him. So you get this competition of different authoritarians. So for those obvious reasons, it was a mistake. And of course it gave the regime an excuse to dramatically escalate its violence. Um, however, saying that they made a mistake this in itself is a misconception, because it is not the case that one day all of Syria's revolutionaries had a mass meeting <laughs> in which they debated, you know, shall we, shall we be violent or shall we not be violent? And at the end they had a vote, yes, we'll be violent, and then they all went out and got Kalashnikovs. That's now not how it happened. Quite the opposite. The, the biggest revolutionary bodies, like the local coordination committees, if you read their um, commentary and their statements um, in the last half of 2011, the first half of 2012, they are ba evil people with phones. They are they are basically <laughs> how how I hate phones. They are especially in America on the metro, and everyone's like this and plugged in. It's, awful. it's, it's even worse than Britain. Um, <coughs> Um, what am I talking about before the phone annoyed me? Uh, Militarisation. The LCCs were begging people. They were saying, we understand the provocations, but please don't pick up weapons. This is what he wants. This is helping him. This is, this is not helping the, the revolution. It was not a central decision. It was the product of a million individual decisions made under fire. And very often the people who made those decisions, the men who picked up weapons, knew politically that it was a mistake as they picked up the weapons, but they felt that they had no other option. And I can't blame them for that, because let's look at three of the ways in which the, the regime provoked a war. The first was torture. Now, this is a regime, of course, like many in the region and around the world, that had always practiced torture in detention. Um, but when the revolution broke out, it started doing it en masse. It started doing it on an industrial scale. It started rounding up tens of thousands of people, of peaceful, non-sectarian protesters and organizers for torture. Um, indefinite detention and in many cases death by torture including children as young as six and seven years old some reports say even babies I don't know if that's true but certainly young children the iconic case is a 13 year old boy called Hamza al Khatib who was picked up um, outside Dera at a demonstration. He became iconic because the revolutionaries named one of their Friday protests after him, the Friday of the children, and people were holding pictures of Hamza. Um, Hamza's mutilated corpse was returned to his parents. His penis had been chopped off. He had gunshot wounds in his limbs. He'd been carved up, cut, um, all over with knives, he had um, cigarette burns all over his body and the signs of electrical burns all over his body. Usually when a fascist regime um, tortures somebody to death, they just get rid of the body, they bury it or burn it, and then they tell the family that, you know, khalas, the, the, he killed himself in detention, that's the end of the story. But in this case they were returning the mutilated corpses to the families because they wanted a response. Um, the next thing is rape. Again, it's a regime which had always raped people in detention, but in, by early 2012 the army was being ordered to rape. So whenever they went into a rebellious village or neighbourhood of a city, they would rape the parents in front of the children, children in front of parents, wives in front of husbands, husbands in front of wives. 
um, you know, Syria is in general a conservative religious society in which sexual honour is considered to be as important, sometimes more important, than life itself. But I'm sure even in liberal New York, if the government started raping people on a mass scale, a lot of people, whatever their politics, even if they were pacifists, would think, I'm going to get whatever weapon I can, at least to defend my front door at least to defend my neighbourhood. I cannot allow these people to come into my house and rape me or my wife or my children in front of me. Um, I can understand that absolutely. I really can. The third factor is military defectors. Um, when you have men that have joined the army either, either because they're conscripts and they've had no choice or they've joined for a career or to defend their country against potential external attack, if you tell those men day after day after day to shoot at their unarmed compatriots, it's inevitable that some of those men are going to take the first opportunity they can to run with their weapons. They don't have the option to just go home and stay out of it because they will be hunted down. So they have no option but to become guerrilla fighters. This is how it started. And why did the regime do this? Because I would argue, of course, the regime wasn't the only um, actor that wanted a war. There were others too. I mean, the jihadist, the international jihadist groups like Al-Qaeda and what later became the Islamic State, um, of course they wanted a war because it gave them an opportunity. The, in 2011 it seemed that the immediate success in some places, it seemed, of um, popular protest, unarmed popular protest, not using sectarian language, seemed to render Al-Qaeda completely irrelevant. So they were very happy when the states used such extreme violence and in some places it degenerated into war because it made them relevant again. It gave them, their, them an opportunity and of course these groups now in Syria and Iraq are very relevant indeed, unfortunately. But the regime, I would argue, is the greatest actor in provoking a war. Why would a, any regime or government or state provoke a war against itself? Well, there are two answers. The first is that it knew it couldn't survive a reform process. If there were a genuine reform process, one thing would have led to another, which would have led to another, and in the end the president and his top elite would have ended up, at best, in prison, um, stripped of their stolen wealth. That's the first thing. The second thing is that they had done it before, and it had worked. It, starting in 1978 in Syria, there was a political movement against the regime. It was not a mass mobilization like 2011. It was more of an elite political party thing, but it did involve <coughs> Islamists, nationalists, Democrats, leftists, communists, liberals, the whole kind of range. The regime responded to this with ruthless repression, violence, torture, imprisonment. Um, by 1982, as a result, all that was left was the armed wing of the Muslim Brotherhood, which out of idiocy or desperation staged an armed uprising in the city of Hama, in the centre of the country. At which point the regime said, great, it's a military conflict, you've brought guns into it, so they went into the centre of the city, flattened the historical centre, used artillery, aerial bombardment, perhaps chemical weapons, we don't really know because no journalist got in, um, and somewhere between between 10 and 40,000 people were killed during that period. Again, we don't really know because this is before citizen journalists and the Violations Documentation Centre and so on. The memory of that terror kept the Syrians silent until 2011. If you look at what the Algerian regime did in 1992, it also faced a democratic challenge, provoked a war, helped to create a violent jihadist opposition and at the end of this civil war that it helped to provoke the Algerian people said okay we're not gonna rock the boat we don't want freedom or democracy or social justice we'll just be quiet so this works the Russians did the similar thing in Chechnya um, I would argue as furthermore that as well as making a, a war they made it as sectarian as they could um, Two, ways, two key ways in which they did this. At the same moment in the spring and summer of 2011 that they were rounding up these tens of thousands of peaceful, non-violent, non-sectarian protesters and organisers, um, they were releasing, they did an amnesty or a series of amnesties in which about 1,500 men were released from prison. 
who were these men? It was a range of men, but the majority of them were Salafist jihadists who had been fighting in Iraq. They'd been fighting the Americans, but they'd also, and more significantly, been fighting the Shia civilian population, and they helped to precipitate a sectarian war in Iraq. When the survivors of these people came back to Syria, they were immediately picked up and arrested and put in prison, where they were kept until the regime needed them again in 2011. It released these people from prison. Zahran Alush, the leader of Jaysh al-Islam, Hassan Aboud, the leader of Ahrar al-Sham, um, Jolani, the leader of um, Al-Qaeda in Syria, Jabhat al-Nusra, and many high-up people in Daesh, the Islamic State, were released in this um, amnesty. High-level defectors say that it went further than that, that some of them actually re received logistical help at the start in setting up their militias. Um, next, a series of sectarian massacres which happened in the summer of 2012 on the central plain between Hums and Hama, where you have Alawi villages and Sunni villages next to each other. Now, these were not spontaneous acts of communal violence, because it's remarkable that they stopped at the end of the summer in 2012. They stopped because they were not natural explosions of hatred. They were organised by the regime. First, the army would shell a rebellious Sunni village. Then, young men, thuggish young men from a neighbouring Alawi village, were sent into the village to cut the throats of women and children. Of course, the immediate victims were Sunni civilians. The target, however, the political target of this was the Alawi community, precisely because the regime depended on the loyalty of the Alawi community, because 80% of officers in the army in 2011, more now, were Alawis. 90% of officers in the security services were Alawis. If this community had withdrawn support en masse from the regime, the regime would have been finished overnight. That's why they had plucked out independent leaders, leftists and religious leaders, from the Alawis over the decades. And that's why they targeted them here with these sectarian massacres, because the result of these throat cuttings was that some Sunni men became so enraged that they went on film on people's mobile phone cameras and they said, bloody mobile phones again, and they went on people's mobile phone cameras and they, and they said, you bastards, you come and kill our children, we're going to come and kill your children. At which point, when the Alawi people, who might have, some of whom might have sympathised with the revolution, who might have disapproved of their young men being rounded up and taken in to commit these crimes, when they saw this, they thought, wait a minute, this is now about self-defence. This is not about democracy or anything else. We have no choice but to stick with this regime because these people want to have revenge from us just because of who we are. Um, so this was very effective. The two targets were the Alawi community and other religious minorities in Syria to keep them scared into loyalty. And secondly, the West. Um, because, of course, this then created this, this sectarian narrative, this jihadist opposition, um, which meant that so many, and so many willing idiots in the West, so many commentators and journalists fell into the trap and, of course, um, and, and, and went along with these manufactured conspiracy theories. Um, we have people like the unfortunately very well-known journalist Patrick Coburn, for example, who wrote in his little book on ISIS, um, he, he described the Syrian opposition as an oppos quote, an opposition which shoots children in the face for minor blasphemy. That's how he describes the Syrian people's democratic revolution. Now, the, the, the people that shoot children in the face for minor blasphemy, that's ISIS. Um, the Free Syrian Army and the Islamic Front militias have lost tens of thousands of men fighting ISIS. Um, ISIS has slaughtered citizen journalists, revolutionaries, council members, medical workers. Um, this is not the opposition. Um, this, is, this is something else. Um, the opposition includes those 400 local and provincial councils that we've been talking about, more than 60 free newspapers and magazines, tens of independent newspaper, uh, sorry, of, of independent radio stations and TV stations. This is the opposition in Syria which we are ignoring. Thank you very much. I'm sure we have a lot of questions from the audience. I just wanted to start by asking a general question about um, the 
I mean, I sort of can gather a general sense of the research you did for this book, but if you could talk a bit more about the people that you interviewed or what, what was the, I guess, structure of the fact finding for, for putting together this book? Yeah, um, <coughs> well, we, we tried to get a, a diversity of people all uh, for, from, from a range uh, of different communities. We interviewed people from different ethnic groups, Arabs, Kurds. We interviewed people from different uh, religious groups. We interviewed people from different parts of the country because the experiences of people living in rural areas and urban areas um, are very different. Um, a lot of the interviews were carried out in the country's neighbouring Syria. Uh, with activists uh, and ordinary people, refugees um, that are in exile or are crossing uh, backwards and forth. We also interviewed um, a lot of people inside Syria on Skype, uh, spoke to family members, uh, spoke to activists. Um, yes. And I, I would just add to that that it, we didn't do anything particularly difficult because as well as the commentators who pretend to be journalists that I've been criticising, there are also some you know remarkably brave, um, not you know foreign journalists who it's not their struggle and they've gone in and risked their lives and spent a lot of time in there um, and and um, and in some cases given their lives like Marie Colvin who was working for the Times and um, that Goto the Japanese journalist who had his head cut off by. ISIS, um, I, Paul Conroy, the photojournalist in, from Britain who I spent an evening with recently, who's still limping because of being blown up by the, the regime. So Janine De Giovanni, an American journalist whose book I've just read, which is excellent. Uh, we didn't really do that. Um, I went in twice, briefly, in 2013 to the north of Syria. Um, we did most of the interviews in neighbouring countries, in Turkey, Lebanon, Iraqi Kurdistan, Jordan. Um, or with people in Syria on Skype. Um, but actually, it's, it's not actually that difficult because y you just need to follow these people. Most of these people have got a social media presence. Um, the, the local councils in Arabic, the, the local councils have all got their own Facebook pages in which they put up their finances and their business and, 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 and so on. Um, so if you start getting engaged with Syrians and talking to Syrians very quickly they will say oh you need to talk to this person who will then tell you you need to talk to her and you need to talk to him and you need to look at what this organization is doing um, it's not difficult to find the information so I do think it's ideology it's not because we're heroes we didn't go in and spend a lot of time risking our lives um, it's it's just not that difficult to find the information if you want to find it um, so I don't think you'll find many people in this audience who share those misconceptions. Um, and I think the analysis you laid out, I think, makes sense to, to most of us by and large. Um, I was struck that you didn't mention the Nusra. It came up afterwards. So, um, and I, I don't know what the, the Coburn quote comes from and whether he was really talking about all elements of the opposition or... I think um, he was, yeah. But all right, so the question then is, uh, it's a sort of what is to be done question in the sense that um, given that there is a, that there remains a popular democratic component of the opposition on the one hand. On the other hand, there, as you pointed out, a lot of guys with guns with some that very nasty ideologies. Of course, this is not an excuse for the crimes of the regime, which no one is, is prepared to defend. Um, concretely, the question is posed in this country uh, in terms of outside intervention, and American intervention specifically. And um, I think it's difficult for many of us to imagine that uh, American intervention in, in the forms it's taken has been ineffective or counterproductive uh, at a minimum um, and uh, is perhaps more likely to exacerbate the situation in, in many ways, armed intervention, military intervention, I'm talking about. So that's being called for. At the same time, of course, Syria has become a proxy war for many of the regimes uh, in, in the region, from Tur Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Right? And, and on the Russians and onward, including the United States directly or, or through intermediaries. So um, it, again, it's, it's a political question of, of what forms of support for the democratic elements of the opposition, right? who are not the people with the guns necessarily, right? and not the people who exercise the, the military power. Uh, and many of them have some very nasty ideologies which are not in sync with the democratic aspirations of, of a great many Syrians. Um, 
what what is it you're looking for, or what vision do you have of ways those elements can be supportive and, and not contribute to making the situation worse? Okay. Well, I'm po opposed to any external intervention um, from any country. Um, but I think that if you take a position uh, where you're opposed to external intervention, you have to have an alternative. Because otherwise what you're saying is that thousands of men, women and children should die to defend your anti-imperialist principles and that's a morally obscene uh, position to take. Thank you. Um, but my alternative has always been to call for weapons to the Free Syrian Army, to allow these uh, people to defend their communities um, themselves from attack. I think America should step back. It should stop vetoing other countries that may want to send anti-aircraft missiles. It's mainly uh, the aerial bombardments, which are the scorched earth, which has been the main cause of civilian deaths, the main cause of the destructions of cities, and the main cause of uh, refugees um, f fleeing the country. Um, I think that uh, the best uh, thing that America could focus on is humanitarian support, specifically to the countries in the region which are really, really uh, struggling to cope with the massive influx of refugees and the strain on, on those countries' resources. Robin, do you want to well, I'd add to that that, you know, when we talk about the militias on the ground with uh, filthy ideologies, I mean, that's true, but it's been over exaggerated. I, I, I think still. The biggest group of fighting men, this is an umbrella term, it's the, is the Free Syrian Army. That's more than a thousand militias um, which go by this term. It isn't one army, it isn't a centralised power, um, but it's still the biggest group. And what that means, it's, it's non-ideological, it has no other aim than to defend its communities from assault. Um, and, and, and then to get rid of the regime and to allow the Syrian people to choose what comes next by some kind of um, process. And um, I would have no problem at all about you know ev everybody that wants to working with those groups. Then you've got the Islamic Front militias um, and I don't like their politics at all and they've definitely committed abuses. Our book is dedicated to Razan Zaytouneh who was almost definitely abducted with three other people by Jesh al-Islam, one of these these groups, um, and they've come, sometimes come out with some very, very unhelpful sectarian rhetoric. Um, at the same time, these are Syrian men with a Syrian agenda, not a global agenda, and with a Syrian constituency who should have a say in the future of what happens in their country. When we were doing this book, we found a fascinating piece of research. Admittedly, it's from 2012, it's from four years ago, so things may have dramatically changed with four more years of trauma and ideological training inside these militias. But some people did some research in which they asked the foot soldiers in Ahrar al-Sham, which is a, an all-Syrian um, but fairly extreme um, militia, and, um, and Jabhat al-Nusra, which is al-Qaeda in Syria. And they asked these, these men, um, or a sample of these men, um, in the future, do you want a civil state or an Islamic state. Remarkably, 60% of those men, including in, in Al-Qaeda, said they wanted a civil state in the future, which shows us that people were not necessarily joining these organizations for ideological reasons. They were joining for pragmatic reasons. If they were members of a free army militia, they couldn't get ammunition, so they were just being shot at. They couldn't even get food. They could go and join an Islamist militia, they would have ammunition, they would have weapons, they would even get a small salary that they could send to their family in a refugee camp. So I think there's a, a good chance that if the Assad regime goes and if its international backers are encouraged to, to leave, a lot of these men will then leave these militias. And one thing that m almost all Syrians can agree on is that they want to get rid of groups like ISIS. Um, but what to do about it? Well, I... Um, Leila and I disagree slightly on this. I don't disagree with um, intervention. If, if, if there were going to be a no-fly zone, um, I think that would be absolutely excellent. It seems uh, um, almost impossible that that's going to happen now because Russia has been encouraged even, or certainly uh, uh, allowed, to take control of Syria's skies. So now it would mean that potentially you would be shooting down Russian planes, which nobody wants to do for obvious reasons. But I think that diplomatically and economically, the world in its own interests should be putting a lot more pressure 
on Russia, not just because of Syria, but because of the Ukraine and other things. I mean, Putin is really very, very dangerous. He's directly attacking the European Union through Syria. He's creating hundreds of thousands of new refugees that are heading to Europe deliberately, and at the same time he's funding far-right anti-immigrant parties throughout Europe, hoping that the European Union will collapse politically before his economy does perhaps next year. Um, if there was a no-fly zone, I certainly wouldn't see that as barbaric imperialism. It seems to me that the interests of the Syrian people and the interests of the world states align here. It's not in anybody's interests to have 12 million homeless, traumatised Syrians. Uh, half the population. It's not in anybody's interest to have a constant escalation of extremism in the region which is now affecting European cities and probably tomorrow America too. So um, it's, it's, it's aerial bombardment by the regime and its allies which is the main cause of the refugee crisis and the main cause of the scorched earth which allows um, jihadists to jump in and exploit it. If America doesn't want to do it, as Leila said, that's fine. Um, let other people arm the free army. And of course I'm not so naive as to think that the Saudis and the Qataris and the Turks are, um, are, want to send anti-aircraft weapons because they love democracy or because they want social revolution in Syria. Of course not. They're doing it for their own geopolitical chess game. Um, but the Syrian civilian communities need anti-aircraft weapons to be able to defend themselves. I'm not talking about giving them weapons to invade Assad's heartlands or to, to destroy his key military bases, just to defend themselves from aerial bombardment. That would make a huge difference. I also think there should be political recognition for the councils, because these are the only representative Syrians that we know of, the only ones that have actually been elected and who are doing practical work to keep people alive. So um, they, at very least they should be on the opposition's negotiating teams, which they're, team, which they're not at the moment. They should dominate it, really. That should be the visible opposition, um, but that's not happening. Any other question? Oh. Um, I mean, I was going to try and, similar to what he said, I mean, people use the Saddam Hussein example, which I understand is a totally false, ridiculous uh, comparison, but uh, maybe the Qaddafi comparison is a bit more apt, because it was a similar situation, and people regard that as being a, a giant mistake. Perhaps maybe it was a mistake, but not in the way that we imagine, or perhaps doing nothing in Syria is actually a far worse mistake. Than, or far worse condition than what Libya is in. But that was one question. But the other question I wanted to ask was more to do with solidarity and the failure of the left. And you, you spoke in the book and in articles about the failure to extend, um, to extend solidarity beyond the Kurds, for example. People have done a lot with Rojab and the democratic example, and a failure to kind of expand that movement to include the Syrians. And the Kurds are a good example of a community that has had a long history of activism in the West. But another, perhaps even more relevant community is the Palestinian community. Mm -hmm. Uh, which many of us who are involved in Syria come from. That's our bread and butter as Arab Americans, is the Palestinian movement. So what do you make of the Palestinian movement's relation? I think there's a lot of division, and it's unfortunate a lot of Arab, uh, the Palestinian movement, I think, a lot of it has grown so distant from the Middle East that they're more concerned with uh, a professor being hired or fired in the University of Indiana, and they don't even know what Yarmouk is. Yes. And that's because of a, a focus on, uh, on academics and if anything, just the West Bank and Gaza, which is important, but people forget about the refugees. So no one knows about the Syrian refugees, about Syria's actions against the Palestinian refugees during the Lebanese Civil War, about the condition of Palestinians today in Lebanon and other places. So what do you make of the, of the Palestinian movement, both the Arab-Palestinian movement, so the more formal left in the Arab world, and the diaspora, student, pro-justice, Palestine movement's relationship to the events in Syria? And what can we learn from the Palestinians and the Kurdish solidarity movements that have this long history. Okay. I'll uh, respond to the second question about the solidarity, and I think that you're absolutely right. I think um, the Kurds and Palestinians have had a long uh, history of building up solidarity um, in the West. I mean, they, 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 they have built up that movement um, over time. Um, and it's very sad that, I mean, uh, the, the Kurds have got recognition as they should have done for, for the achievements that have been going on at the, on the community level in Rojava for the wonderful experiments they have been doing setting up these communes um, to, to govern uh, those areas. But that's very similar to what 
Arabs and others, um, because in mixed communities it's not just Arabs involved in the local councils, it also for members, for example, it's Kurds and Arabs working together in local councils. Um, they, they've not received the same kind of solidarity and um, I think some of that is to do with, with the history of the solidarity movement, but I think other things to do with that uh, uh, racism or, or uh, towards Arabs. Um, yeah, I mean, Palestine's been very sad. I'm someone, I've lived for many years in Palestine. I've been very active with the Palestinian solidarity movement mm. for a long time. Um, and I'm extremely disappointed of how the Palestinian solidarity movements reacted. Um, the place actually where I found most solidarity for the Syrian revolution is in Gaza. Right. In <laughs> Gaza, everybody would always come up to me, ask me, how's your family? How much right. they support the Syrian revolution? They really understood the kind of tyranny that people were facing in Syria and they really identified with it. Um, right. But a lot of the left in Palestine uh, has been very divided. They haven't stood in solidarity with the revolution and certainly the solidarity movement outside has been very divided and, and you're right why are people not asking about the situation of Palestinians in Yarmouk why are Syrian Palestinian lives less important um, than other Palestinian lives what about all the Palestinians that have been tortured and um, I don't have an answer for it ultimately and um, but I think that we should that we should definitely be challenging it and um, it's a of complete disassociation from the Middle East almost it's just the, yeah. ever since the Oslo Accords, it's the West Bank, Gaza, and then academics even, you know. It's a huge, uh, some teacher lost his job or a student got an F, and then people don't know that Yarmouk exists. Yeah. Well, it's a disassociation from reality. A, a very <laughs> sad thing is how much it's splitting the Palestinian movement right. as well, because right. Syrian Palestinians, many of them um, that are pro-revolution, now do not identify. Uh, with other parts of the Palestinian movement and this is a very very sad thing for the Palestinian movement as well as for, for Syria. You know conspiracy theories are, are when they come from outside they're almost racist I mean the the, the idea that that um, you know people are um, Arabs are happy to be tortured to death, that's normal because they're used to it until some CIA man comes and whispers in their ear and tells them that they should be upset about it. It's just ridiculous. People in, people in, people, people in Syria are not waiting to hear from Obama or the Israelis what they should do. I mean, they're responding to immediate challenges that they have in their daily lives. And when it comes from Arabs themselves, as it often does, it's a kind of inferiority complex, it's a kind of impotence, it's the set, because if everything's to do with big foreign conspiracies or the Jews or the Freemasons or who run everything or whatever, then it's completely disempowering. There's there's no point taking any action with your neighbours to try and improve your life because you can't. There's these cosmic plans that are going to stifle you. Um, fundamentally for the, the left and, and for such like, I, I, I think it's a, it's a degeneration of leftism into a state obsession where you know a chess, we, we focus on the chess game of states. We think there are goody states and baddie states, and then you get into this ridiculous binarism where my enemy is the American em Empire, so therefore I support the Russian Empire. What? <laughs> or I've worked out that CNN is propaganda, so therefore I believe Russian state TV. And well, what? I mean, this, this, this isn't. These are not logical. These binaries are not. Or I hate Saudi Arabian right-wing religious fundamentalism that's pro-American. Good. So therefore, I support the glorious progressive regime of Iran, which is murdering trades unionists and ethnic minorities and gay people. You know, it just doesn't make any sense at all. Um, about your geopolitical questions, I mean, I, I, I think that Libya, um, again, there is a general assumption, um, left and right, that the um, intervention in the British and French, with a bit of American backing, in, um, intervention for a few months in Libya, um, was the cause of an absolutely terrible chaos which is um, ruining the whole of North Africa. Um, and that seems to me a gross oversimplification. Um, here is a, a, a state that was ruled by a really insane and psychotic um, dictator um, for four decades. He banned politics and he eliminated anybody who spoke out or who thought independently. Um, all of that is irrelevant. There was a popular revolution in Libya. That's irrelevant. On the first day of the popular revolution, the <coughs> army split. Irrelevant. Um, the 
because the dictator used extreme violence to try and get control again, every young man in the country got a gun months before Britain and France got involved. That's irrelevant. Um, then Britain and France got involved, did a couple of months or three months or something of bombing of his tanks, of Gaddafi's tanks. Oh, that's very, very, very relevant. Suddenly white people are doing something, so history is being made, and there are consequences. When Arabs do things, it doesn't matter at all. Um, then they leave. Now, you could make the argument that there should have been more intervention. You could make the argument that they should have stayed longer and helped the disarmament of the different militias and, and so on, helped a stabilisation to happen. That depends on your politics. It's very debatable. I mean, it may be that the intervention wasn't the right thing or not. I don't know. But I would say this. It's a, it, to be expected that when a, a, a horrible dictatorship collapses or, or, or is thrown out, after decades, there is going to be a period of bloody chaos. That's what happens. You know, when Hitler fell, there were years of chaos in Europe, when there were different, that was after a war as well, when there were all kinds of displaced groups trying to find homes and so on. I mean, that's what happens after these dictatorships and after wars. Um, there f about 5,000 Libyans have been killed since the fall of Gaddafi. In Syria, we're probably talking about 500,000 people, and the regime has not, unfortunately, fallen. Um, there are Syrian refugees who are running to Libya to take set shelter in Libya. So the idea that Libya is an absolute hell because of British and French intervention strikes me as a grotesque oversimplification, but it's something which is, it's an idea which many people hold. Um, in Iraq, of course, 2003 is a totally different situation. There was an American occupation, American invasion, an American neocon remaking of the country, partly on sectarian lines. None of this happened in Syria. Um, in Iraq, there was no popular revolution in 2003. There was in Syria in 2011. That's a fairly fundamental difference. I think a more, a better comparison, it's still not a very good one, is with 1991 in Iraq. Remember that Saddam Hussein in 1990 had invaded Kuwait. Um, America then organized a huge international coalition of states to kick him out of Kuwait. They destroyed the Iraqi infrastructure. They destroyed the Iraqi army. Um, they were actually sitting in Iraq, and the Iraqis perceived that George Bush Sr. was encouraging them to rise up against the dictator, and even seemed to be saying that he would come and give them help or protection if they did. So they did. The Shia, mainly in the south, and the Kurds in the north did rise up against him. Well, the Kurds um, benefited from a no-fly zone in the north, which is probably why the Kurdish part of Iraq um, since then has been a, a lot in, in a lot better shape than the Arab parts of Iraq. The Shia in the south, actually the American military signed a paper with the Iraqi army giving them permission to use their helicopter gunships to get this under control. Um, that's the time of mass graves in the Iraqi south. That's when Saddam Hussein used Sunni sectarianism as an ideological weapon to put down the uprising in the south. It's when sectarianism got so bad in Iraq. When you added, added to that, that m massacre um, 12 years of sanctions which destroyed the middle class and made them leave um, and destroyed the, the, what was left of the infrastructure and then they went in and invaded in 2003, it's really not surprising that the place collapsed in the way it did. So I, th I think a lot of these assumptions, they're often well-meaning, um, but they're often not based on, on facts or reality or good analysis. I want to, I saw some questions back there first. Let's take three at a time so that we can hope to get through all the questions. Go ahead, Nader. Um, hi. Um, thanks for your talk, guys. Um, so as, as people who, like, I think we all agree that there are certain actors in Syria that we want to see ultimately win, right? Like, and you know, the LCCs, the democratic activists and, and people like that. Um, and, in, and in Professor Lachman's what is to be done question, um, you, you made the case for like how certain military, like, certain military strategies can like help them win. But I was wondering what your thoughts were on diplomatic or political strategies. Mainly, like, do you think 
what do you think about the prospect of a political solution in Syria? Not a, mili not a military solution, but like a diplomatic deal struck between the US and Iran and Russia. Not as an end in itself, because of course that has its contradictions as well. It would probably be imposed on Syria, etc. But just as a, as a means to create the political space for the people that we want to see win, ultimately win. Is that, do you see that as an option? Or, or do you think the, the, like the military approaches are more uh, likely or feasible? Or, yeah. Let's, do you mind if we collect two more questions? Okay, and sorry, there was another hand I saw first, and I'm coming to you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just would like um, to know if they had any feedback to um, Bernie Sanders' statement during the Democratic debate that ISIS um, we should focus on defeating ISIS and if you want to start with that discussion. And we'll come here. Uh, two things. One, the book is dedicated to Razan Zaituna. I wonder if you could tell us more about her. Uh, number two, there's an effort to revive the U.S. peace movement and to put the Palestinian cause in solidarity with Syrian democracy at its heart. And I wonder if you could give us some tips, maybe from British experiences, things to help us out. Um, well, for Nada's question, I mean, I think the ultimate thing that everyone wants to see in Syria is a ceasefire, um, is, is a stopping of, of the bombings. Um, I think one thing that's been really uh, important over the past six weeks since the reduction of hostilities is that we've really seen this revival of civil activism inside Syria and also how that activism has radicalized that people in Idlib are not only out on the streets protesting against the regime using the original slogans of the revolution not the black jihadist banners um, but the Syrian flag but also that they've been protesting against Jabhat al-Nusra and they're making very clear that they're not going to accept the replacement of one authoritarianism with another authoritarianism so I think if we could move to a real ceasefire, um, there would be a resumption of, of, of civil activism. I know that many of the activists uh, would return to Syria um, to, to contribute to that. Certainly, I've spent a lot of time in the region with refugees, and they always are saying, if the regime goes, if there's a ceasefire, we want to go home, we want to uh, rebuild our communities. So I think that's essential. Um, I'm not hopeful that there is a real ceasefire at the moment. This is one of the reasons why um, we, I focused on the answer before about allowing uh, communities to protect themselves. But certainly, um, I don't think uh, that a military solution is the ideal solution. I think getting a ceasefire and allowing, uh, enabling a, a democratic space where people can continue uh, to, to, to uh, organize is wonderful um, and of course I believe that the local council should be key to the negotiation pro uh, process because as Robin mentioned they're the only uh, democratic representatives of the Syrian people that we have uh, and they should be involved in that process. I also think it's vital that ordinary people uh, give much more support to the civil resistance to some of these organizations and groups that I spoke about because it's essential that we support them to keep going so that they don't get drowned out by the guns, so that they don't get drowned out uh, by the Islamists. And there's so many diverse groups. I mean, you find out about them and choose which one speaks to you, get in contact with them, uh, see how you can support their work, either materially or if you're good at languages, translating their statements, um, etc. Um, I'll Yes, I'll talk a, a bit more about Razan Zaytuna, a very good friend of mine. It's the woman to whom our book is dedicated. Um, she was a human rights activist prior to the revolution, passionately committed um, to defending the rights of political prisoners. Um, during the revolution, she became a key figure. She was the founder of the local coordination committees, which was um, a body established to coordinate the different revolutionary uh, groups throughout the country, try to coordinate the protest movement, uh, get unified messaging. They did a lot of media work. Um, she was also the founder of the Violations Documentation Centre, wow. um, which was it is a, a wonderful organization which reports on violations not only by the regime but also um, by other actors against civilians. 
probably because of this work and because she rejected any kind of authoritarianism and um, she uh, along with, with her husband and two other activists were kidnapped in December 2013 and nothing's been heard of the force since and um, it's likely that Jaysh al-Islam which was uh, which is a very key player in the Ruta where she was based in Duma um, uh, was was behind the abduction and um, but she really symbolizes um, for me that the, the people struggle against all forms of authoritarianism. A very strong, uh, very passionate uh, woman with a strong moral compass. You know, the other day there was fighting um, south of Aleppo and um, Russia declined to bomb the rebels and Nusra um, and therefore the Iraqi militias and so on that were holding this area were pushed back and um, it was a victory for the rebels and Nusra. Um, it's interesting that the Russians declined to come and, 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 and bomb. So I don't, re I don't know if there's a pos possibility of a real political solution because I've got no idea really what's happening behind closed doors. I don't really know what Putin's end game is. Is he just kind of making a point and but accepting the inevitability of the fall of Assad at the end of it? Or is he really kind of dedicated to keeping Assad at least in part of the country as a warlord and then and then the solution will be that um, the country is split up into spheres of influence with a, an imperial sponsor and if you know the Saudis run part of it th through proxies and the Iranians another part through proxies and the Russians get to keep their base and I don't I don't really know um, I'm not very hopeful about it um, but I agree completely with what Leila says that the important thing is if is is the minimum safety of the people um, not only an end to, to aerial bombardment, but for the, for the refugees to feel that they can go home without being arrested and, and disappeared and tortured and so on. Because if that does happen, it's inevitable. You can't put this back in the box. You know, you can, we, you, the Arab world in general um, cannot be returned to the way it was before 2011. You can't rule 21st century Arabs with security states in, in the same way that you ruled 20th century Arabs. It's an impossibility. So, so if the people are able to go back and feel that they have a minimum safety, then it's unstoppable that they will work something much better out. Um, about Sanders, I understand why um, maybe if I were an American I would be excited about Bernie Sanders because of his domestic policies, which sound really interesting. His sounds much more um, impressive than anything else on offer his social and economic uh, um, and ideas about justice in this country it sounds great I unfortunately don't think he understands foreign policy at all um, I don't think he recognizes that Putin is a real threat um, he seems to think that that having a Saudi his weirdest idea is to make a Saudi Iranian joint force to stabilize the Middle East you, you may as well have a joint Martian Venusian um, <laughs> force to stabilize Africa I mean it makes no it makes no sense at all and as as for his idea that um, you know everybody has to focus on Isis and ignore Assad but uh, it, again it just shows a remarkable ignorance of um, how Assad has deliberately built up Isis how there's um, for most of the time there's been an undeclared non-aggression pact between Isis and Assad certainly not always because there's also been terrible killing of um, regime soldiers by ISIS. Um, ISIS is a symptom, not the cause. Um, and actually, going after just ISIS in a way is counterproductive. In a way, obviously, you know, if you work with people on the ground, they've worked quite effectively with the PYD. Um, they haven't worked with the free army groups who have showed themselves to be remarkably effective anti-ISIS fighters. Um, if you provided um, air cover for all of these groups, then yeah, sure, at the moment ISIS is losing territory and it's becoming weaker inside both Iraq and Syria. The military realities mean that is the case. Um, but in the long term, if you're saying to these traumatized Syrian people on the ground, that the Assad regime and Iran and the transnational Shia jihadists of Iran are all off the table. They can do what the hell they like to you. They can use sarin gas and chlorine gas and scud missiles. They can bomb your cities day after day after day. They are responsible for the vast majority of the casualties. We're not going to bother with them because politically we'd rather not and we need them there murdering you for the sake of stability. But we're going to focus on the Sunni identity jihadist party 
that's actually feeding ISIS's narrative. It's in the, you might get rid of ISIS, but something else will come up in, in its place because you're just feeding the narrative. You're saying that we don't care if foreign <coughs> Shia come and mur murder you. You know, we, you can have Christian planes from the Russian Orthodox planes and um, Western Protestant or whatever they are planes and, and in, in league with the Jews and, uh, um, and the Shia on the ground are all going to come and kill everything, blow up everything in Syria except the regime which is responsible for the vast majority of civilian casualties. It's not giving a good message to the people on the ground that the world actually cares about their lives. So I think it's fairly counterproductive. Um, I think one question that was, um, I had, which is kind of peripherally been touched upon, is the political situation of Kurdish forces in northern Syria and northern Iraq at this time. Um, I was wondering, through your research, if you had any contact, I mean, you said that you interviewed Kurds. I was wondering what your opinions are on sort of the contribution of the Kurds to the Syrian war at this time, uh, the international communities. Uh, real divisions over it because as we know, you know, the United States and Turkey have vastly different views. The EU and Turkey perhaps have different views. I'm not really sure what the EU's policy efforts are, but the EU seems to be uh, tying itself closer and closer to Turkey as sort of a sponge for refugees. And yet, I think this question of Kurdish statehood or perhaps an autonomous region <coughs> will become a serious problem as the war winds down. So I was wondering if you could give your thoughts on that. And are there any other last questions? This will be the last one. Oh, go ahead. Um, do you think there's anything like um, a pinpoint in like Middle Eastern history that this is kind of like a legacy of, you know, something that you can like, trace back to? I can take one more. Yes. Um, no, my question is, very do you plan on doing events in the Middle East? Uh, and do you plan on having the book translated into Arabic, Farsi, Russian, Turkish, Kurdish, uh, yeah, the other relevant languages besides English? <laughs> do you want to talk about the PYD? Um, well, well, I can start. I mean, I think um, what the Kurds uh, have achieved in Syria over the past five years has been really remarkable. Um, I, I, I'm a huge supporter uh, of the communes um, that they implementing direct democracy on the ground. In many ways, they've been more progressive uh, through their commune structure than the local councils because women have a much stronger representation in those bodies. Um, unfortunately, whilst women have played a key role in the Syrian revolution, they're often uh, not very represented in the local councils. Um, I'm also a big supporter of the idea of democratic autonomy, this idea <coughs> of democracy without the state and establishing that I in these three cantons. I think that decentralization could be um, a positive model for a future Syria because it would allow communities to organize according uh, to their democratic, uh, to their demographic uh, cultural characteristics and how they want their life to be organized within their communities. That for me is very different from what we think is being uh, considered for Syria now, this kind of sectarian carve up imposed from outside. I think all Syrians um, do not want their country uh, to be divided along sectarian lines. It would precipitate a massive ethnic cleansing because communities are not neatly split um, into geographic areas. Having said, um, my support for, for, for some of the things that are happening on the ground in, in, in the Kurdish regions, I um, have a lot of concerns around the PYD. Um, I think that uh, the Democratic Union Party, which is now in control of the Kurdish regions, I think it has strong authoritarian tendencies, despite its libertarian rhetoric. Um, it's really been uh, opposing um, and cracking down on other Kurdish uh, political groups. It, it's fired on, on, on Kurdish protesters at demonstrations. It's closed down independent media stations. Um, I'm also very concerned um, about its recent declaration of um, federalism. 
uh, for the simple reason that I find this a huge violation of the Kurdish right to self-determination. It has not included the Kurdish public uh, in that discussion. Um, that doesn't look uh, very good to me in terms of democratic aspirations. I'm also concerned um, that it looks now that it's trying to link up the cantons in Arab majority areas. This, for me, goes against the idea of democratic confederalism. It's a state-building project. Um, I think it's contributed greatly to increasing uh, ethnic tensions between Arabs and Kurds, which also the Arab opposition is very guilty of. I mean, at least they could have said, um, we're going to move the word Syrian Arab Republic, we're going to recognize uh, that this is a Syrian Republic for different ethnic groups, uh, and listened more and respected more Kurdish um, demands for self-determination. It's an interesting question yeah. about legacy, you know, is there any kind of specific moment in the past where we can say that all of this started? And, well, yes and no, there are millions of moments that you could choose, and it, it's interesting because it's, it's very ideological what moment you choose, it, and, and it's just a way of making an argument, and, 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 and it's never entirely satisfactory, so it depends on the argument you want to make. If, if you want to say that the major problem in Syria is Sunni Islamism and you don't like the Saudi regime, then you could say that it all began when the Saudi state was formed. Or it all began with Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, the, 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 the founder of Wahhabi ideas. Or you could go back to previous centuries, it all began with Ibn Taymiyyah, who, is the, who, is, who, who, is, who was the Sunni theologian, who was the kind of intellectual ancestor of Muhammad Abdul Wahhab. So you can, or you could go back, if you have a problem with Islam in general, and say, it all began with the Prophet Muhammad. And, and um, if you think it's all about the Sunni-Shia conflict, you could say it all began when the, the, the split in the, you know, the argument about who should have been the, the caliph after the, the, the prophet died. Um, you could also, if, if your point is that American imperialism is the most destructive point in the region, you could say it all began with the American occupation of um, Iraq in 2003, that's when Sunni Shia stuff got worse. If you, if you hate Saddam Hussein more, you could say no, it all began when Saddam Hussein started using sectarianism as a governing tool in um, Iraq. You could well say it all began with the British and French Sykes-Picot carve-up of the region into these states that we have now, um, with the Balfour Declaration in Israel, with putting um, minorities, the sectarian engineering, creating um, armies of minorities, and so on. So you, you can find as many um, legacy points as you like, but the important thing is, whenever you read this, don't take it for granted recognize that this is an argument, a rhetorical argument that somebody is making because they have a certain agenda. We all have agendas, us included, you know, that's, that's normal. The, 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 the history is rich and full and you can find any point that you like to make an argument out of. Do we want to do events in the Middle East and have it translated into Arabic and Kurdish and Turkish and uh, Farsi and so on? Absolutely, definitely. Um, if you've got any ideas of people who will invite us and pay for us to fly places, then come and tell me about it. Um, if you know people who would like to translate it, then brilliant. Um, we, I really hope, obviously, that there are Arabic and Kurdish translations. Um, if we can't find anybody, to, uh, any actual publisher to pay us, then we'd be happy to, any person who is a very competent translator, we'd be very happy for them to do it and not pay us anything at all, because we'd like it to be read. Um, by people of the region, and we'd particularly like it to be translated into Farsi. Right. Um, there are um, th there are organisations like Nami Sham, for example, which is made up of um, Iranians, Lebanese, Iraqis, Syrians, um, which is trying very hard to get good information to people in Iran about what their regime is doing in Syria. Um, so yeah, we would like that to happen. So what about democracy now? Are you going to appear? I don't think so. No. People should complain about that. Yes. Why not? Yes. People should yes. write to stories at democracynow.org and complain. Is it that they don't want to invite you, or it's uh, something else? Well, I, I, the pride, no, I, 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 apparently they're still thinking about maybe inviting us tomorrow morning, but we haven't heard anything yet, so I don't think it's going to happen. And I think at this late stage, if it did happen, we'd say no thanks anyway, because we've got too much on for tomorrow. Um, it is notable that they've had over a month that they've known we're here and they've chosen not to organize anything. Um, I, I hear that they don't have an objection with inviting us, but what they want is to bring somebody to express the other side oh, okay. at the oh, same wow. time. 
and I do have a problem with that because yeah, they, you know if they if they had somebody on to talk about you know um, the anti the anti apartheid struggle in South Africa they didn't have to you know they didn't feel that it was necessary to bring on a white racist to explain that <laughs> that black people are barbarians and they have to live separately um, if they have a, a Palestinian activist on they don't feel that they need to have a liquid activist on as well but in this case they feel that they and Amy Goodman um, I don't think she's here at the moment, so fortunately we wouldn't be meeting her, but I, I find it... I mean, I've, I've seen programmes on Democracy Now! in which they have both Patrick Coburn and Reith Abdelahad, and they'll both agree that there is no such thing as the Free Syrian Army, and the opposition is all jihadist. Um, that's their balance, you know. And, and Amy Goodman herself, whenever she talks about the sarin attacks, she will say the supposed sarin attacks, oh the claimed God. sarin attacks. So. Um, I mu if it was five years ago, I would, f I, I would feel very strongly that we have to go out and appeal to that audience. Right. At the moment, I kind of gi I've given up. I kind of feel like the people who want to, to believe in these conspiracy theories, there's not much we can do to help. They don't want to hear about actual Syrians on the ground. They've got their own stories. So don't bother complaining, you know. Just maybe, oh, be yes. a, may maybe try and build a real kind of progressive media instead. Right. On that note, um, I'm so sorry to have to bring the event to a close, but we must. Um, please do pick up a copy of the book if you want, 20 bucks, which is discounted off the cover, and they're here to sign it for you. Thank you. Thank you.